everyone, and welcome to Take Two Radio Music. I'm Pam, your host. And joining me today is a singer, songwriter, recording artist, and an awesome guy, because I love his music, Mikey Wax. <laughs> Hello, Mikey. <laughs> hey, Pam. How's it going? Thank you. You're welcome. It's going great. Thanks for joining me today. How's yeah, everything with you? Everything's nice. It's, uh, it's, rain- it's pouring here in New York, but what are you going to do? Ah, <laughs> you must have got it from Chicago because it's sunny today and we had rain. So maybe, maybe. It, it's good. It's a good day to write some lyrics, though. So that's right. That's right. You got to think <laughs> of the positive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just don't look outside. <laughs> You're right. Sorry. <laughs> well, I always like to start out uh, having our guests tell a little bit about their backgrounds for our listeners who may not be familiar with you. Um, when did you know you wanted to be in music, and who or what inspired you? Oh, man. Well, um, I started playing piano when I was, like, eight years old, and I'm from Long Island, New York, and uh, I had a piano in our living room growing up, and my dad was a piano player. And I used to, like, just naturally gravitate towards watching him play and hanging out by the piano, mm-hmm. and he taught me he taught me my first piece of music, classical music, and I was, like, eight years old, and I just knew right then wow. that I could always – yeah, so I, I just knew right away, like, it was something I just enjoyed doing, and I started writing songs right away, so I knew really early on that, like, just, just music for me was just a great way to express myself, and, and kind of like a release, and almost like a friend, so. hmm hmm Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, my dad played piano, too. Actually had a lot of musical people in my family, but I never gravitated towards playing anything. It was more just listening. <laughs> Yeah. So I think some people just have it in their blood and others don't. <laughs> I totally I totally hear you. My my dad had like the whole setup back in this was uh this was maybe late 80s and uh he had like the whole MIDI technology was just coming around recording technology for for mm-hmm. home systems and and we used to just blast like funny noises like old saxophones like fake fake noises and I had so much fun uh-huh. creating with the instruments and stuff like that, so it kind of just became a hobby early on. So. Did you ever learn to play anything else besides the piano? Uh, yeah, I picked. I taught myself guitar uh, a little bit later when I was like 16 in high school. Um, I got heavily into the Dave Matthews band. I, I really wanted to be like Dave Matthews, so I, ta- I taught myself guitar. And it was, it was actually easier to learn it having known the piano so well, because it's you know it tra- you're able to translate once you once you know one into into the other. So. I'll take your word on that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I will. (laughs) Well, moving forward a little bit, about three years ago, you self-released your first album called Change Again. And, my gosh, the recognition you got from across the world was amazing. What did you think when you found out your music was so well-received? I I couldn't believe it, honestly. Like, I I was doing the record – right after I graduated from college and I was like, you know, I knew I had a bunch of songs that I had, I had to record, just, you know, I had to lay down just if anything to, to document the times or whatever. And I put it out independently and my brother started managing me because I always hated the aspect of self-promoting and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but he, he had no shame. So he started getting all my friends, all his <laughs> friends and everyone to kind of rally on Facebook and, and get the music spread. And then, uh, Lucky enough, like a few months after we released the first record, uh, YouTube was doing features of the day on the homepage of, of unknown, of unsigned artists, and mm-hmm. we were lucky enough to get a feature one day. And like overnight, wow. the video for my song "Kiss I Go Again" got half a million views, which really helped us, you know, get get our foot in the door, get get a head start. So, wow, that's that's yeah. amazing because you know there's got to be like a million people, you know, submitting to have that day. And you were lucky enough to get that. And and not only luck, I mean, it it takes a lot of perseverance, I'm sure, by your brother and yourself. Exactly. And that's what we say. And recognition that the music's good. Yeah, exactly. I don't. I, I'm. I, I like to think on the, uh, like you said, on the positive side, that they wouldn't feature something that that, that wasn't good. So. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> but uh, definitely a little bit of luck, and you know, but you know, it, the persistence definitely pays off because you can get your foot in the door, but you have to keep finding ways to keep those fans intrigued and keep them along for the ride. So. Exactly, exactly. Well, you opened for Howie Day, Serena Ryder, Ryan Cabrera, James Durbin, and more. What was it like to be on tour with all those great artists? 
It's also going on tour with them because, like, they had been, you know, when they were starting out, they had somebody that they went on tour with. And, like, you know, you learn mm-hmm. from each experience like that. So it's kind of like passing down the torch and you kind of learn, you know, the way of the road, so to speak, and, mm-hmm. and, how, to, uh, and how to do show after show without, you know, without losing your voice or, you know, or just staying focused and, and learning how to, learning what to do on the downtime before a show or, you know, just, you know, keeping engaged with your fans and your friends and your family while you're out in the middle of nowhere. So it's all, of, it's everything combined on the road is it's just like its own experience and it's nice to have that under your belt because it definitely goes a long way. So Right, exactly. Yeah. Did any of you, any of them give you any advice? Yeah, I don't, you learn, there's always advice, but, like, you learn more just by watching. But I'll never forget, like, on the tour with Howie Day, I remember his his tour manager told me, like, you know, by the time that that song, Howie Day song, Collide, became a number one, it's like, at that point, they weren't, like, jumping up and down like like it was the biggest thing in the world because they had worked so hard for it. It was like, almost like they felt that it was deserved, you know, at that point. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was very, I thought that was very interesting because, you know, for most artists, like, if you're like, oh, I'm going to have number one, like, it gives you, like, this feeling of, like, excitement. And obviously you're excited, but, like, it requires so much that goes into it that almost, like, you you, you know, you've worked for it. It's not like it just happened out of pure luck, so. Right. Nothing, usually, I should say, usually nothing happens overnight, so I can understand that. Yeah, there's always that. a lot of work that goes into it, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, exactly. I thought that was an interesting piece of advice because when you're starting out, you're like, oh, I should have this and have this, but you realize how many years and, and all that stuff goes into it, so. Right, exactly. Yeah. Now, one of the most highly successful songs, of course, was In Case I Go Again, and I'd like to play that song for our listeners before you tell us more about it. Cool. So if you can um, hold on one second, I'll go ahead and play that for you. Okay. i 
that was In Case I Go Again by Mikey Wax. Now, how did you come up with that song? It's so beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. I um, That one, it's funny, I actually haven't heard it in a while, so it's interesting looking back now. But um, I remember writing that one. Some songs you just remember when you, exactly what you were doing. And I just finished graduating uh, college uh, at Vanderbilt in Nashville, and I'd just gotten back to my childhood house, and like I was like in my old room, and it was just like the complete silence of being in your old room and, like, looking around you, and it's just, like, so much time has gone by, but, like, you know, things just kind of look the same, but, you know, there's, like, small differences, and maybe it's just, mm-hmm. like, the difference in yourself. So it was just, it was a very interesting feeling, and I just picked up the guitar, and it kind of just just came out over, <laughs> you know, I finished it that <laughs> night. Some, some songs you're not that lucky with, but that one, I, like, I remember staying up, like, till 5 in the morning, just, like, writing in all these lyrical ideas, and then pretty much finished itself within a day or so. Well, that song also had huge success. It was on MTV's Real World, Ghost Whisper, and more importantly, the instrumental of it was featured on NBC during the 2012 Summer Olympics. Yeah, I mean, what that an honor so cool. that I, is. I had, no idea, I had no idea they were going to do that. And, like, out of nowhere, my phone started, like, blowing up, like, text messages from my friends. They're like, are you aware your song was just on the Olympics? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Well, how do they – do that i mean so obviously they didn't yeah. contact you to say that they were going to choose it ba- basically ahead of time like i'm i'm signed up with a few licensing companies and they pitch the music to third parties like that like nbc or or whatnot and and they have mm-hmm. you know if they use it sometimes they'll notify the third party you know the, the middle the middle guy who's the licensing company or sometimes they won't but but it, it doesn't really matter because performing rights organizations like ASCAP or BMI take care of, like, all the financing and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it, it doesn't really, you know, sometimes you're notified, sometimes you're not. But a lot of times you are, but for that one, for whatever reason, I had no idea, and it was it was actually a really nice surprise. So. Wow. Well, <laughs> yeah. So did you already have an instrumental made of it? I mean, because how would they do it without the words then? Yeah, so when you're doing, like, when you're making a record, it's always, like, a good idea for artists to – like you do two mixes, you do one, actually you should do three mixes. You do one with like, you know, how you want it with vocals and instruments, and then you do one with like just in case you do one with like the vocals much louder in case somebody needs like a really loud vocal, and then you do one with just the instruments. So you print it, you print it kind of three different ways. So I have that pretty much for all my music. So. Wow. That's good to know. Um, I have a friend that's actually a manager of some indie artist, and um, we were kind of having this conversation last night. 